or maybe a minute or two early, but we'll make a start to our, our meeting because I think the, the camera is rolling and we've got an online audience. So we might as well sing for them as well as for ourselves. <clears throat> we'll start by singing 126, the love that Jesus had for me to suffer on the cruel tree that I a ransomed soul might be is more than tongue can tell. We just stand to sing hymn number 126. The love that Jesus had for me meeting tonight. Our God and Father, we would thank thee that those of us who have become Christians, those of us who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, can indeed say from the heart, his love is more than tongue can tell. Mm -hmm. Remember that very often when people came into blessing from the Lord Jesus Christ, they were lost for words. We remember that blind man, when he was asked about the Lord Jesus Christ, he would just say one thing I know, once I was blind, but now I see. And he would have such a simple testimony, but such a profound one to tell. And 
that we are gathered before thee and we bless thee for each one that is able to say stumblingly from the heart uh, that we were blind and he gave us our sight mm -hmm. and he brought us into the father's house and his banner was set over us and we, his banner over us is love and we would just thank thee for the love that the Lord Jesus Christ had for us and we bless you that love is for all sinners and we just pray that if there's any who are listening to this on the broadcast or any gathered in the hall tonight that don't yet know, they've never entered into that love of the Lord Jesus Christ, they've never stepped onto the ground that he has prepared by his death on the cross of Calvary and accepted him as saviour. We just pray that tonight as the message of the gospel is simply explained that perhaps for the first time they'll take that step. And so we just ask for thy blessing to be upon us. We pray for, uh, we pray that thou would give help to those that would open thy word, give them clarity of thought. And we just pray that it might not be the voice of men that's heard tonight, but thy voice from heaven speaking to this audience tonight. So we ask for this and ask for thy blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Second hymn will be 771. Both of the hymns I've given out are thinking, obviously, of the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I suppose nearly every Sunday night, unless uh, that, we, that just doesn't really happen, that we don't have a Sunday night where the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ isn't, isn't mentioned because it's so fundamental to the message of the gospel. But it'd be a strange Easter Sunday if we weren't thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. So awful load for that bowed head, terrific weight for that marred form. He bore your sins, your burden dread, he braved your judgment, fearful storm. 771, we'll stand again, it goes to in Christ alone. I'll start it. 771. Oh, awful load for that bowed head, terrific weight for
Well, good evening and welcome to the Gospel meeting this evening in Glen Craig. It's a privilege to be back for the preaching of the Gospel and I was just thinking as I was sitting in there, it's a privilege to preach the Gospel any time but it's a special privilege to preach it on Easter Sunday. Um, so I count it an honour to be with you and we'll leave plenty of time for the exercise of my brethren. Turn with me please to John's Gospel chapter 19 continuing the theme of the cross of the Lord Jesus. John's Gospel, chapter 19, and we'll read just for sake of time, verses 30 and 31. John 19, verse number 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, that's the vinegar that the soldiers had given him, to drink. When he had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Back then, please, to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. The Lord Jesus has died upon the cross and was kindly taken down and buried in a tomb. And at the beginning of the chapter, there are women who are coming to the tomb anxious. And we'll commence to read then uh, in verse number eight, as the angel replies to these women, Matthew 28. And verse number five says, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. For he has risen, as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Lastly then, Revelation chapter 22. Last chapter of our Bible is Revelation chapter 22. And verse number 7, Revelation Chapter 22 and verse number 7, the Lord Jesus is speaking here. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And that will do for reading this evening. We look to the Lord to bless it to us tonight in the preaching of the gospel. I want to consider with you tonight three phrases uh, that we're going to lift from the texts that we read. Three phrases, and each of the phrases contain three words. And I want to draw your attention to these phrases because really, as we're thinking much about Easter this weekend and the Easter story, really the Easter story, as Ewan has already said, is the heart of the gospel story. And so tonight in the preaching of the gospel, although it's a special occasion of remembrance of the first Easter, really we don't have any new message to bring you from the word of God. And so everything that we're going to say, you'll have heard it before. And I would love that tonight perhaps you would listen with extra care and attention to the message of the gospel. In summary, the message of Easter the message of the gospel is this, that Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's, in a nutshell, the story of Easter. And many out there will be remembering that story today. Sadly for them, it has no personal impact, no personal reality upon their life. It's just a story that's told. <clears throat> But I trust that tonight as we consider something of this again, that it will have an impact upon your life. You know, I was just thinking, uh, just as Easter is symbolized by new life, whether it's little spring lambs on an Easter card, little chicks out of an egg, whether it's seeds that are being planted in the ground at the moment, buds on the trees, no matter what it is, when you think about Easter, you think about new life. And it's the very same with the message of the gospel. 
we're here preaching the message again to you tonight that you would have new life. And what an Easter it would be for you if you found new life even tonight. The first little phrase that I want to leave with you is this. John's Gospel, chapter number 19. The Saviour is upon the cross. His suffering is over. His work of salvation has been completed. And he cried that triumphant cry. It is finished. It's finished. And I want to just write over that little phrase. A statement of divine accomplishment. Because I want you to see that there was something mighty accomplished at Calvary. Isn't it the hymn writer that said, When the Saviour said, "'Tis finished, everything was fully done, done as God himself would have it, Christ the victory fully won, vain and futile the endeavour, to improve or add thereto God's free grace is thus commended to believe and not to do. I want you to ask yourself two questions tonight as you think about the cross. As I've said already, many are thinking about the cross and many are thinking about the resurrection and it's just a story that's told. They never really stop to think about the personal impact and consequences of the cross for them or the personal impact and consequences of the resurrection for them. And so to highlight that for you, ask yourself these questions. And we'll try to answer them. First of all, when you think of the cross, ask yourself this. Why did he die? Why did he die? And then ask yourself, what did he finish? Why did he die? And what did he finish? Well, Some are remembering the death of our Lord Jesus Christ as a great accident. It was just a misfortune in their eyes that he wasn't recognized as the true Messiah and was taken and crucified and it was really, it was too bad, it was an accident. Well, isn't it the Apostle Peter that says he was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. So it was no accident. Others say it was just a great travesty of justice. We're going to see it was a place where the highest justice was ultimately going to be satisfied. Why did he die? Well, the Bible tells us why he died. The Bible says that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried And that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. You know, the believers here in Glen Craig were remembering this morning that he didn't die because he had any sin of his own. And the Savior that we are presenting to you tonight, the one who died for you, the one who rose again, he was absolutely perfect. He was absolutely spotless, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. He was the only man to ever live, to never have committed a sin. And so we can be absolutely sure that when the Savior was hanging upon the cross, he wasn't there because of his own sin, for he had no sin of his own. And he was the only one who never deserved to die. And yet he was the one that was willing to die. Isn't that what the hymn says? There was one who was willing to die in my stead that a soul so unworthy might live and the path to the cross he was willing to tread all the sins of my life to forgive. So he died for our sins. The Bible also tells us that Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Why? What's the purpose in God's great plan of having 
one just man die upon a cross for the unjust ones. Well, the verse goes on to tell us, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. That's why he died. He died for our sins, and he died that we might be brought back into a relationship with the God of heaven. I hope you're starting to grasp something of the colossal consequences of the cross for you as an individual tonight in the meeting, whether here in the hall or listening online. Don't be mistaken. Calvary has huge consequences for you in the meeting this evening. And so, whether here in the hall, whether listening at home, no matter how many sins you have, no matter how massive your sins may be, in your mind, we're here to tell you on Easter Sunday that because one sinless man died upon a cross willingly, that you can have all of your sins forgiven tonight. Is there anybody here in the meeting or listening who would love to know their sins forgiven? To, as the scriptures told us, be brought back into a relationship with God. Do you look around you at the Christians that gather and notice something of the joy and the peace, the purpose, the fulfillment that they have not because of anything that they are, but because of everything that he is to them. He's a savior worth having. Listen to his cry again from the cross. It is finished. Why did he die? He died for our sins. Our second question, what did he finish? He didn't say, I am finished. He didn't say, you're all finished to the people that had so cruelly treated him and hung him upon a cross. He could have said that. He said, it is finished. Referring to something very specific. It is finished. Well, what is it? The work of salvation. Everything that God demanded because of sin, the payment had just been made in full. And so whether you want to think of it in relation to combat, as in the battle was finished, well, that was true. For what a battle was fought at Calvary when Christ suffered for sin. The greatest battle to ever take place. The Savior could triumphantly cry in concerning that battle. It is finished. The battle of sin. But what about a statement concerning commerce? Because not only is it a statement concerning the battle and the combat of Calvary, but it's a statement concerning the commerce or the payment of Calvary. Because it could also be translated like this. It is finished or paid in full. Paid in full. What was paid in full? Well, it was the penalty that a righteous God demanded because of sin. You say, how much was the penalty? I don't know. None of us know how vast that penalty was. It was eternal because sin brought death, eternal death. And the Savior had just paid in full everything that God had demanded. And that cry from Calvary rang into the very courts of heaven. And heaven replied, it is enough. God was satisfied. We'll come on to that in a moment when we think of the resurrection. But I was just thinking concerning this statement, how often people hear it, it is finished, and yet how few seem to get saved. And the work's finished. There's nothing for them to do. 
I'm sure you're all familiar with IKEA furniture. And if you come to our house, you're very welcome, by the way. If you come to our house, uh, I seem to think we're a bit of an IKEA showroom. And since I've got married, I've had to learn a thing or two about IKEA uh, products. Some of the IKEA products that you get, you just get a box with all the parts and the rest's up to you. You have to manage to put them all together to get the finished article. Other products that you get, well, they're part assembled, you may call it. Um, say it's a table, the, the majority of the work will be done for you. You might have to screw on the legs or whatever, and it's, it's a fairly speedy process. But then there are other products that you get. They tend to be smaller things, and really all you have to do is just lift them off the shelf and take them because they're, they're finished. There's nothing for you to do. Well, that's just a little illustration for you, isn't it? As far as the work of salvation is concerned, far too many people seem to think that it requires some little bit of work from themselves. They're trying to add their own little bit, whether it's by coming and going to meetings, trying to, to work up enough faith, trying to have a bit of anxiety, trying to feel bad about their sin, trying to clean up their life. All of that is just trying to add your own little bit. But really what I want to press home tonight as I move on is that this was a work that was absolutely complete. Nothing, not a mite was left unpaid when he our judgment bore. All you have to do is trust. All you have to do is rest. Accept what Christ has done for you. It is finished. A statement of divine accomplishment. Come now to Matthew 28. We've left the cross. Three days have passed. And these women, well, they were hopeful that the Savior would fulfill his promise. Because he told them he would, he would rise from the dead. And you can just see them as they're coming eagerly to the tomb. And they're wanting to catch a glimpse of the Savior. Has he risen? Has he kept his promise? And well, this time we'll call it a statement of divine assurance. And what a statement it is for the meeting tonight. Not now it is finished. He is risen. What hope that brings. You know, if all I had was to preach about a, a saviour who lived and died, it wouldn't be enough. And just as the hope of the Easter story is the hope of the gospel, the power of the resurrection is the power of the gospel. If Christ be yet dead, we are still in our sins. But up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. Those of us who are saved were saying in our hearts just now, Hallelujah, Christ arose. We've tried to emphasize the significance of his death for you personally. Why he died, it was your sin. What he finished, it was the work of salvation. What about the significance of the resurrection? It's not just a historical fact in the, in the message of the gospel. Romans 10 and 9 says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You know, it wasn't until recently that I noticed the significance of the resurrection in that verse. Before I really thought it was asking you to believe that Christ rose from the dead. But that's not what the verse says. It doesn't say that if thou shalt believe in thine heart that the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead. Now what's the significance of that for you in the meeting tonight? Well, it's this. 
If God raised him from the dead, then God is satisfied with what his son accomplished at Calvary. So much that he raised him from the dead and has given him a seat at his right hand. What a message we have to preach tonight on Easter Sunday in Glen Craig. Payment made in full. A God in heaven absolutely satisfied with what was accomplished at Calvary by the person of his son. He, wrote, he, he was raised from the dead as the stamp of divine approval upon the whole business. And all that's left for you to do is to accept it. So simple. You know those that preach the gospel here. It breaks our heart to, to see those in our own communities that we love who need the gospel, who need a saviour. And you're missing out on so much because of something so simple. If you were asked to go and walk the West Highland Way, I'm sure you would all be off tomorrow if you thought it would bring you one step closer to heaven. And yet you're not even asked to move a muscle, not even asked to pay a penny because it's finished. God is satisfied. But something's missing. Faith. That's the link. That's what makes the difference. You know, I had great trouble in believing and trusting and resting, all of those words that you hear before I was saved. I was so occupied with it. I would have asked anyone if I was brave enough how do I know that I've believed? How do I know that I have accepted Christ? How do I believe the Bible way? Well, when we came over here to Scotland on our holidays, we came by boat. Sometimes we come by plane. Um, and I'm sure everybody here has been on either one of those at some point. And, well, you say to me, and you trusted the captain on the ship. I did. Uh, how did you trust him? How do I know that you trusted him? Well, I would just say I, I drove my car onto the ship. Committed my life into his hands. Trusted the life of my family to the captain of that ship. I didn't go up and demand to see a structural report of the ship and see the, the captain's seafaring license. No, I just got on board and accepted that he was able to take me to where I needed to be, whether it's a plane. And you get on and some of us who are a bit more nervous of flying, maybe we're a bit jittery and there are others who are fast asleep. But the thing is this, those of us that are a bit jittery. We're not any less safe than the man that's lying fast asleep across the aisle. You see, salvation, their safety, doesn't depend on their feelings. But it absolutely depends on the, the pilot or the captain in whichever case it may be. It's the same with salvation. Commit your soul to him. Just rest upon what he has done and accept that because the sinless saviour died, that my sinful soul is counted free because God the just is satisfied to look on him as the sacrifice accepted for sin, to look upon that and pardon me. That's salvation. It is finished. He is risen, but the story doesn't end there. He's coming back again. We heard about it this morning. The rapture. When Christ will come back to the air to take the Christians home. To be in heaven forever. It is finished. He is risen. I come quickly. Statement of divine appointment. This appointment could be kept tonight. Before the meeting is over. Before the night is through. This great appointment in God's calendar could have taken place. Not only has the Saviour died, not only was he buried and rose again, he's coming back. 
My question to you is this. On Easter Sunday, if the Lord Jesus Christ was to come back to the air to take those who were ready, those who have known their sins forgiven, how would it be for you? Would you be ready? Have you ever had a moment of personal salvation? Or would you be left behind to face the judgment of God? I leave you with that challenge, taking more time than perhaps I should have. I trust you'll grasp something of the significance, particularly of those first two points. It's not just a historical story that is told around Easter time every year. It has real, deep, personal consequences for you in the meeting tonight. It is finished. He is risen. I come quickly. May God bless his word. <coughs> I'd just like to read a few verses from the book of Revelation and chapter 1. The book of Revelation, chapter 1, the last book in the Bible. Revelation chapter 1, and we'll read from verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Uh, down to verse 17. And this is John writing, and he has just seen the Lord Jesus. The verses before this give us a description of the Lord Jesus in his glory. In heaven. In verse 17, John says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. And we look to God to bless us for the reading from his word. The Apostle John wrote this book and it's all about things that he saw in heaven. If you read through this book, it's an incredible book because it tells us about things John saw in heaven and it tells us about things that are going to happen in this world and tells us about the future. And uh, we, we heard that in the last chapter of that book, the Lord Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. But of all the wonderful things that John saw in heaven, the greatest thing that he saw was the Lord Jesus Christ. So much so that that's how the book begins. The title is The Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. And that's why we preach the Lord Jesus. He's the one that you need. We've heard already tonight about the work finished on the cross and the Lord Jesus who rose from the dead and is coming again and today he's in heaven and that's where John saw him. And the Lord Jesus speaks to us from heaven and as John sees the Lord Jesus, there's a lot in chapter one, it's a wonderful chapter uh, to read, but after John describes having seen the Lord Jesus in his glory, the one who was triumphant over death, had conquered death and was raised from the dead and was in heaven in glory. When John saw him, it says, I fell at his feet as dead. He saw one who was so full of glory, he shone like the sun, his hair was white like wool and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. His voice was like the sound of many waters. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ in his greatness and in his glory. And that's where he is today. 
And as John saw him, he felt like this. The great apostle John, who had known him and had leaned on his breast when he was here on earth, but when he saw him in his glory, he saw the majesty and the greatness of the Lord Jesus, and he fell at his feet as dead. But the Lord Jesus laid his right hand upon him and said, Fear not, I am the first and the last. The Lord Jesus touched him, and he would love to touch your life tonight. I wonder if there is some fear that would hold you back from trusting him. And as John trembled at the sight of the greatness of the Lord Jesus, he's touched by the right hand of the Saviour. And he says, fear not, I am the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. There's nothing before him, there's nothing after him. He's the beginning of all things, he's the end of all things. He is eternal, the one with no beginning and no end. He's the first and the last. He is everything. And he says, I am he that lives. We preach to you this evening a living saviour. One who is in heaven. One who lives. But wonder of wonders, he says, I am he that lives and was dead. Other translations say became dead. And it reminds us that the Lord Jesus willingly entered into death. He willingly went to the cross and experienced death. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's why we are subject to death. That is the result of sin. It's why we die. But the Lord Jesus had no sin. And yet, in order to die, he became a man. And in order to die, he took upon himself our sins. As the Apostle Peter tells us, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And he died for sin. He died for our sins. The Apostle Paul tells us that in this way that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried. And he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Yes, the Saviour was dead. He entered into death. But he is alive. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Never again to die. One who lives forever. One who will reign forever. One who is called in this chapter the Prince of the Kings of the Earth. The one who has all power and all authority. The New Testament tells us that God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's the great person we're telling you about this evening. But his call is to acknowledge him as Lord now. Some will acknowledge him as Lord when it's too late. But all will acknowledge him as Lord he says, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and of death. Because he has conquered death. And he can deliver souls from going to hell. He can save them. He has that power. What power is in the Lord Jesus Christ? What power is in his work on the cross? What power there is to change people's lives and he is able to do, do that because he holds the keys of eternity he is able to take a soul to heaven he's able to forgive their sins he's able to save them we sing it in that well-known easter hymn don't we there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin he only could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in. See, he has the keys. Everything in eternity hinges on him. <coughs> Whether an individual goes to heaven to be with Christ as a soul forgiven, 
as a sinner who has trusted the Lord Jesus as their saviour, or whether they have to go out into eternity without him, he's got the keys. He will either be saviour or judge. I wonder what it will be for every soul in the meeting tonight. Oh, I can't describe it in the way that, that, that John saw it. What a sight it must have been. And you can almost see John trying to find the words to describe the glory and the greatness of the Lord Jesus and to record the words that the Lord Jesus spoke. We maybe can't present him in his true value and his true worth, but we commend him to you as a saviour this evening. And there are souls in this room who can testify to what he has done for them. We heard that the work is finished. It's complete. He is risen. He is alive forevermore. He has the keys of hell and of death. And he can save your soul this evening. And he would say, fear not. And he would just love to come and touch your life and save your soul. And bring you forgiveness so that you can know the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour too. Shall we pray? God and Father, we thank thee that on this Easter Sunday we can remember that he is risen and we thank thee that he is not in the grave and he was not left on the cross but we thank thee that he rose from the dead and we thank thee that he is at the right, he is at the right hand of God and we thank thee that he is coming again. We thank thee that he came to die for our sins on the cross. We thank you for that amazing love. And it's our earnest prayer this evening that all who have listened to thy word this evening would truly know him as their saviour. And if any have not yet trusted him, we pray that they will be helped and blessed by thee just to trust him this evening and know eternal life through faith in him. We thank you for our time together and for all thy love and thy grace and thy blessing to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we give thanks for this and ask thee to bless us as we separate now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.